today I'm going to be talking about generally my interest in the interaction between above and below ground communities and the cycling of nutrients, or more specifically carbon and nitrogen, between these two communities. And so we think about interactions between plants and soil. These can take many different forms. For example, plants grow extensive root networks below ground that form intimate relationships with soil microbial communities. And then on the other end of the spectrum, especially us in temperate systems, we think of plant leaf litter, which at the end of the growing season drops from leaves and creates this nice pulse of organic matter that enters the decomposition pool and the cycling of carbon and nitrogen back through the soil pathway to be made available once again. And so what might this litter decomposition pathway look like? Well, let's say that this is a single red maple tree. And this time of year, the trees are budding. Soon we'll have leaf out. And that's a huge, as you all know, energy investment for the tree. These leaves and deciduous systems stay on through the growing system th season. And at the end of that time, the leaves senesce and fall to the ground and create this great pulse of organic matter where then it is cycled by the decomposer community. And this can include larger detritivores like earthworms, which we consider the charismatic megafauna of the soil. And these earthworms chew up the leaves into more um, smaller fragments that are more easily colonized by the microbial decomposers or the fungi and bacteria. And through this decomposition pathway, it releases nutrients back to the soil for then to be taken up by the plants in the next growing season. And so through this decomposition pathway, it's really one of the primary controllers over, you could think, net primary production or what species can grow at a site as it's making these nutrients available. But step three here isn't as simple as we might envision, right? Especially when we think about a temperate system. All of the leaves that fall from a tree at the end of the fall do not completely decompose during one growing season. So all of the nutrients from a leaf are not completely returned to the soil for that plant to take up during the next year. And so my research really breaks down this decomposition pathway to explore what's controlling the rate of mass loss over time and over geographic scales. And so when we think about litter decomposition, it's primarily driven through this triangular relationship between climate, litter quality, and the decomposer community. And this triangular relationship was first proposed in the 70s by a gentleman named Mientmeyer, and has really stuck around since then. Whereby, at large geographic scales, climate is the primary driver of decomposition patterns. So if it's warmer, we're going to see faster decomposition than at a cold site. But within a geographic or within a climate zone, litter quality would be the primary driver, followed by decomposers. But the decomposers, and I'm sorry that my leaf is just sitting there. I did not mean for that to happen. But anyway, followed by this decomposer community, which is almost treated as an afterthought. And it's because in these large scale decomposition experiments, we haven't been able to detect the role of the decomposer community and its function as an independent driving variable. So it's been black boxed in these models. So when we talk about climate with decomposition, it's often referred to as this climate decomposition index, which includes precipitation and um, temperature as a primary driver. But climate can directly and indirectly in influence decomposition. So if we think about an arid system, the role of photodegradation can directly break down litter where biotic controls are suppressed due to it being too dry and too hot. Or in a very wet system, we can see the leaching of soluble compounds from litter due to this direct precipitation pathway of climate. And then when we think about litter quality, there's this range in chemical recalcitrance of the litter, which, which mainly decides how fast it can decompose. So at one end of the spectrum, we have recalcitrant litter. And you could think of that as trying to chew through a cardboard box. It's really tough and left behind most often by the decomposers. And this is a litter that's high in um, carbon, so high C to N or high lignin to N ratio. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, you have labile litter, which is more easy to decompose. You could think of it as wanting to chew up candy. It's a high energy return. It's easy to break down. It has low carbon to nitrogen or low lignin to N ratios. 
And so this range in chemical lability of the leaf also a, a direct driver over decomposition rates. And then, as I said before, the decomposers are often in this afterthought. But it can range from these larger detritivores to the bacteria and fungi, which are actually the workhorses here, cleaving chemical compounds in this decomposing organic matter. Now, throughout the talk, I'm focusing here on the microbial community. So as I reference decomposers throughout the rest of the talk, know that I'm talking about this microbial group of fungi and bacteria. So within this decomposition triangle, we have direct and indirect controls of climate and litter quality on the decomposers as well. So climate can directly impact decomposer community through metabolic activity. So again, if it's warmer, we're going to have faster metabolism occurring with these microbes. Or we can have indirect effects, whereby there's cold or warm adapted enzymes which are produced by these microbial decomposers. And again, litter quality has this direct control over decomposers where they prefer labile compounds that are easy to break down and have a high energy return <clears throat> for the decomposers themselves. But when we think about these decomposition processes, and when I was forming my original research program, I was thinking, well, why is the decomposer community an afterthought when it has these direct and indirect influences of climate and litter quality? And maybe what can we do to break apart this black box that they've been put in? But this black box of decomposer function really also dates back to traditional assumptions surrounding this community. And so traditionally, we're assuming that these communities are so single function units across space. And it's because they're extremely species rich. So if we step outside the building here and pick up a handful of soil, there's hundreds of thousands of different microbes in this handful of soil. And then we go to Ames, Iowa, where I'm coming from, and pick up another handful of soil, there's going to be another hundreds of thousands of microbes in this other handful of soil. And because of this increase, incredibly species-rich diversity within these handfuls, it's that, well, there has to be someone, even if it's not the same species, within these two communities that can perform the same task at the same rate. So if we put these two handfuls of soil, both on, say, a red maple leaf, and watch it decompose, holding all other conditions the same, they should decompose that litter at the same rate because somebody's there, leading to this idea of functional redundancy. But really, over the past decade, we've shifted past this. And dating from work um, by Dim, Jim, Dim, Jim TG, excuse me, here at Michigan State, he actually showed us that microbial communities have biogeographic patterns down to a few meters. And that these patterns are generated by both the present habitat that you're under, so whether you're coming from a grassland community versus a forest, and also processes such as selection or dispersal. But importantly, these patterns across space may extend to function. So these microbial communities may actually be influenced by their resource history. So again, if we take two handfuls of soil, one from a grassland and one from a forest, and put them on the same litter type, so again, this red maple leaf, well, maybe because they've been exposed to different litter histories, they'll process that red maple leaf at different rates, leading now to this idea of functional dissimilarity. So over time, we've shifted from this idea of black boxing, this single functioning decomposer unit, to thinking about, well, no, this is a collection of organisms, so who's there and what are they doing? So again, if we go and take a soil community from Ames, Iowa, and then another soil community from here in Michigan, and finally a soil community, say, from North Carolina, take them all and put them on the same litter type, well, maybe, in fact, these functional differences or this geographic distance between these three communities will actually cause variation in mass loss that's attributed to, attributable to the microbial community above and beyond climate and litter quality. And so my work tries to tease apart these various abiotic and biotic controls over decomposition processes to quantify them, to see their um, relative influence over decomposition processes and scaling up carbon cycling. So today I'm going to be stepping through a series of lab and field-based experiments which explore these different biotic and abiotic controls. So first, I'll start with describing an experiment which basically just explores microbial community function, so this, this biotic control. Then the interaction between climate 
and microbes. So the interaction between biotic and abiotic. And then finally, I'm excited to present some newer data I have exploring this new potential abiotic pathway of decomposition within temperate systems. <clears throat> so to start with, I'm going to start with a lab-based study where I asked, do historical contingencies shape microbial community function? And so within this, I had two different questions. First, do microbial communities with different resource histories, so again, if they're sourced from different litter environments, do they have the capacity to become functionally equivalent in a common resource environment? So taking them from a grassland in a forest and putting them on same litter type over time, can they actually become equivalent in function? And so when I'm talking about function, throughout most of the talk, I'm talking about CO2 production. And so why CO2? Well, despite what our EPA administrator says, it is a known greenhouse gas for one, but it's also a proxy of metabolic activity, and it also speaks to nutrient cycling. And so in the subsequent figures on the y-axis, we have cumulative CO2 respired, or you can just think of that the higher the number being more mass lost of that leaf. It's more decomposed. And so each of these circles in this example diagram is a different soil microbial community. And so we would want to put that soil community again on a leaf and watch decomposition over time. Well, say after a round of 100 days, we have very distinct function, functional differences in how they process that leaf. Well, what would equivalent be? Well, they would all come together and process that litter at the same rate. And why might that happen? Well, we know that microbes have short generation times, so there's the potential for rat up, rapid adaptation to occur. Or we might have a shift and abundance within the community itself. Or maybe we won't see that response due to the fact that this is setting in a lab setting where we're limiting dispersal opportunity. Or maybe we'll see a mixed response depending on the chemical recalcitrance of the litter, so that coming into play. And so to do this study, I was lucky enough to be part of these long-term research experiments in the southeastern United States. And so in the southeast, I worked at three different, three geographically distinct sites. The first being at the Whitehall Forest in Athens, Georgia. The second being at the Calhoun Experimental Forest in South Carolina. And the final being at the Coweta Long-Term Ecological Research Site in Western North Carolina. So despite them being geographically distinct, they were all the same soil type of similar pH, so I knew that those basic soil characteristics wouldn't influence um, the, the, the experimental design when I was trying to focus on the microbes within the soil itself. And so within each site, I chose a paired hardwood and grassland site from which to collect a soil sample or a soil community. And then also just at the Coweta LTR, I collected the hardwood litter, which was rhododendron litter, and grass litter, which was little blue stem. And so I brought these six soils and these two litter types back to the lab to combine them in a microcosm experiment, which is just these 50 milliliter centrifuge tubes with the lids modified for gas analysis. And then I measured CO2 production on an ERGA um, uh, over time. And so to see whether or not these communities could increase in function, I did multiple rounds on the same litter type. And so to break this down, I sterilized my litter, because again, I'm concerned with the microbial community being sourced from the soil environment, not any existing microbes that had already colonized the litter I'm collecting. And I combined this with just a small amount of soil and an inoculum approach within the centrifuge tube, and watch CO2 evolve across 100 days. And um, at the end of 100 days, the soil litter inoculum mix that was at the end was re-inoculated onto fresh litter of the same soil type. And that happened for a second round of 100 days and a third round of 100 days. So if the six soil communities were exposed to rhododendron in the first round, they were also exposed to this hardwood litter in the second and third rounds, and the same being for the, for the grass litter. So what did we find? Well, here again, on the y-axis, you have total mass loss, or this cumulative CO2 value. And on the x-axis is those three distinct sampling rounds of 100 days each. So each symbol represents that total mass loss for a single soil community after 100 days. 
I want you to ignore what the symbols actually represent, except to know that they are those six soil communities, and just pay attention to the larger message that despite which litter environment they, these communities were placed on, and on the upper side we have the grass environment, the lower side the hardwood environment, these six soil communities were functionally distinct at the beginning of the experiment and maintained um, their functional dissimilarity over time, and in some cases became more distinct with time. What's interesting, even though I just told you to ignore what the symbols represented, I want you to note that the open circles is the soil community sourced from the Coweta hardwood environment. So it had this home pairing or the potential for local adaptation to occur on the really tough to decompose litter material. And what's interesting is despite the litter environment that it was placed on in the lab, it had the highest function and the five other communities seemed to increase in function towards that home pairing being sourced from the tougher material. So there was some sort of increased functional capacity with this local pairing of, and it being a more tough to decompose material. It's also interesting to note that on this more labile environment that the microorganisms seem to have plateaued in function after 300 days where they're still increasing in function on the really tough to decompose environment. <clears throat> okay, so we see that dissimilarity is maintained. They don't become equivalent. Well, they also increase in function. And is this function in associated with a trade-off? Or does increased function on a novel litter source equal a reduced ability to degrade an alternate litter substrate? And so what does that mean? So within the experimental design, after 200 days in the lab on the same litter source, that community was continued onto the same litter source. So again, you're exposed to hardwood litter for 100 days, exposed again for another 100 days, exposed again to hardwood litter for a third round of 100 days. But after 200 days, if you were exposed to hardwood litter, you were also crossed onto the grass litter. So now you have an experimental history of one litter, and you're traded onto the alternate substrate and vice versa. So what happened there? Again, on the y-axis, you have your cumulative mass loss. And on the x-axis is your experimental litter history. So what that community was exposed to for the first two 100 rounds, first two rounds of 100 days each. The color of the bar represents what litter substrate you were exposed to for the round three experiment. So for grass, this lighter colored bar, if you were exposed to grass for 200 days and kept on grass, you had incredibly high function. You are good at chewing up this really sugary labile grass substrate. But after 200 days, if you're used to chewing up something really yummy and delicious and you're giving something really hard, this rhododendron litter, your function dramatically decreases by over two thirds. Whereas that's not the case if you're given this really tough environment to live in. So this dark bar over here, if you're exposed to hardwood litter for 200 days and then crossed onto this yummy labile litter environment, your function really doesn't change. You're not perceiving differences in this litter type. And this supports this idea of functional breadth that was floating around for microbial community function. And functional breadth states that if you come from a really recalcitrant litter environment, you have a wider functional breadth or a wider functional capacity to degrade compounds that are really recalcitrant and those less so or more labile, and you don't differentiate between those two differences. But if you're coming from a really labile environment, you have a narrow functional breadth or a narrow functional capacity to decompose substrates that are more tough. And so through this experimental design, we were able to um, show that. And so through this project, again, we confirm that functional dissimilarity exists and that these differences are maintained over time. And it suggests that perhaps decomposition rates can't be simply predicted from litter chemical characteristics, that there is this influence of the decomposer community and their function needs to be considered. And again, resource history influences how they're functioning in the contemporary environment, potentially supporting this idea of functional breadth. So why care about functional breadth? How would that scale up when we're talking about larger scale habitats or environments? Well, we're all in a temperate system. We'll say an ice storm comes through next winter and knocks down a swath of a forest. Well, how will carbon cycling respond within that forest as succession proceeds? 
We'll say that forest is composed of a tree with really recalcitrant litter, making that soil environment really tough um, for the microorganisms there. So they're adapted to and have a wide functional breadth. Well, as succession comes through, then perhaps with this wide functional breadth, we won't see a change in carbon cycling within that system. But that might not be the case if a forest is composed of more labile litter tree species. <clears throat> so again, thinking about can we detect differences in microbial communities within a realistic setting, so switching from an ice storm to climate change? Can we detect their function independent of climate? And with climate decomposition experiments, a lot of these have taken place along climatic gradients. So we can project forward in time for a cold site based on what's occurring at a warmer site. And so I wanted to work along an elevational gradient to explore this idea as well. And so with climate change, we are expecting that species ranges are expected to move poleward in latitude and upward in elevation. And so we won't necessarily just see a shift in populations, but also relative abundance within these populations. And coming from a forestry department, we also know that, well, it's a matter of these trees getting there, being able to produce in time. So there's all different factors. But generally, we're expecting them to follow these climatic niche shifts. Um, and so with these shifts, well, maybe new litter inputs to upslope communities may not cycle, or the carbon and nitrogen may cycle at different rates due to differences of the functional capacity of these microbial communities along this gradient. And so to explore this idea more, I again worked down in North Carolina at the Coweta LTR, and then also at the Blue Ridge Parkway to get a higher elevation site. And along this gradient, I worked up from a lower elevation, um, really nice, wet, warm environment, composed of a labile tulip poplar species as the dominant overtory tree species, up to a high elevation environment that was colder, windier, harsher for the microbial communities, and composed of this really tough to decompose red, red spruce. And so again, moving up this climatic gradient, am I moving towards harsher climatic con conditions, but also towards more recalcitrant litter species? And so using this climatic gradient, I had two parts of this experiment. The first was a laboratory microcosm study that was fully replicating a field litter bag study. And I'm going to step through the laboratory microcosms first, which again use this as a soil inoculum plus litter design that I just explained in the previous experiment. And so with this, I took the soil communities and dominant tree litter from each of these three locations and brought them back to the lab to measure CO2 mineralization over 300 days. And based on my previous study, as well as assumptions that I discussed earlier, there were three different hypotheses driving this work. The first, again, is this idea of functional breadth, which to visualize that again, if we have a high elevation site composed of more recalcitrant litter and a low elevation soil community sourced from a labile environment, well, this high elevation site won't distinguish between litter types that are more labile. So we could see mass loss equivalent between the recalcitrant and more labile litter species. Whereas for the low elevation labile site, it will decompose its labile litter much faster, as we saw in the last study, than the recalcitrant litter. And then there is, of course, this idea of litter quality that we discussed at the beginning of the talk, which represents this dark bar. That's the light, the labile litter type that will just decompose faster, regardless of the community, if that's a primary driver. And then there's this idea of home field advantage, which is pulled from the sports literature, right? So we think that sports teams perform better at home than away. And it's been applied to litter decomposition to say, well, maybe there's a home field advantage of a soil community with its home litter environment or some sort of local adaptation occurring. So since this um, recalcitrant litter type in this white bar is sourced from the high elevation site, it will decompose much faster than the labile litter because it's its home pairing, and the opposite being true of this labile litter. So another factor coming into play with decomposer effects. And what did we find? So again, on the y-axis, we have cumulative mass loss, and this is at the end of 300 days again. And on the x-axis, we have the three different soil communities, moving from low, mid, and high. The color of the bar represents the litter type, 
So the light color bar represents the most labile tulip poplar, and the dark bar represents the most recalcitrant spruce. The letter represents statistical difference with the bold letter representing that home pairing. So what do we see? Well, overall, there is a clear litter quality effect. Regardless of soil community, oh, excuse me, there, um, the most labile litter, tulip poplar, is decomposing fastest. But, which really excited me at the time, there's also hints of other theories coming out here. That potentially, say we look at the mid-elevation site, which is sourced, which the um, birch is sourced from, or this mid-gray color bar, it um, decomposes the home litter at a fast rate, but it's equivalent to this labile species. So it's maybe a hint of home field advantage here, maybe not that clear. But what's more clear is the effect of functional breadth, whereby the high elevation soil, which is sourced from the dark bar of litter, is decomposing the, dark, the most recalcitrant litter type at an equivalent rate to the more labile birch, or the mid-gray, whereas this labile tree species is being decomposed super fast. So it's giving candy and it's still going crazy, but it is regarding these two other little types um, at, the same, at the same rate. Whereas the opposite is true of this low soil community, which is sourced from the labile litter environment. It is processing the three different litter types of increasing chemical recalcitrance at significantly lower rates. Well, since this is actually hard to pull out from this, can we quantify it somehow? somehow? And so with this theory of functional breadth, we would say, well, if you have a wide functional breadth again, you're not going to perceive litter types as differently. And so the differences in mass loss should be more similar. So for each soil inoculum, I looked at the average percentage difference in mass loss among the three litter types. So for the low soil, it would be the difference between this light gray, mid gray, light gray, dark gray, and mid gray, dark gray, to give me this average percentage difference value, which I did for each of the soil types. And so here is that average percentage difference on the y-axis and each of our three soil inoculums. And you can see here that the high soil inoculum sourced from this recalcitrant environment, which we would expect to have a wider functional breadth, does in fact perceive less difference and decompose the three different litters at a closer rate than the low elevation um, soil community source from this labile environment. So there is in fact some evidence that we're moving from a narrow to a wide functional breadth along this gradient. <clears throat> so through this, when we take out the effect of climate, we can in fact draw out that yes, there's a litter quality effect that we would expect to see based on other decomposition experiments, but also there is this persistent effect of decomposer function coming into play so that it's not just strictly litter quality effects within a climate zone. So what happens when we bring climate into play? And again, this experiment was fully replicated in the field using litter bags. So if you aren't a, um, familiar with litter bags, it's basically just you take window screen mesh, you sew it together or seal it together and put a known weight of litter in there and then you put it in the field. We put it in the field for almost three years and basically watch these leaves decompose over time. <laughs> so it's a sit and wait kind of approach here. And so thinking about, well, how can I pull out this effect of decomposer community function when we're also dealing with the effects of climate? So we dealt with it in the lab by taking out a climate effect, but what happens in the field? I'm gonna have to account for that somehow. And so to do this, I used a new regression approach, which I call the decomposer ability regression test, which accounts for variation in decomposition as a function of a quality index, which is litter chemical quality, plus a soil ability term, plus home field advantage term. So again, this local adaptation. And so in developing this regression, I actually went back to the sports literature, back to the statistics literature, which um, other home field advantage equations had been pulled for when applying them to decomposition. And said, oh, well these people created this home field advantage regression, and in doing so, trying to examine or quantify a home field advantage effect for sports teams, they also had to account for an innate ability of that, that team. And so Clark and Norman used 
um, European soccer teams in developing this regression. And they said, well, okay, yeah, we can, we can win more at home than away, but what about Manchester United that always wins? And I don't know if this is, I don't follow European soccer, but that's what they said in the paper. They always win, and so maybe they just have the best players, and that's giving this innate ability that contributes to this home field advantage effect. Well, can we do the same for soil decomposers? And I said, well, why not try? And so what might this look like? Um, this is just to give you an example. So with each of the terms in this regression, you're given parameter estimates for each of your soil communities or litters that you're including. And so with your litter quality index, say you have rhododendron, pine, and grass litter, you'll see a high quality index for grass because it's really labile and a low quality index for pine because it's really recalcitrant. And then what about the ability? What would it look like again? So again, you have these three communities sourced from rhododendron, pine, or grass. Well, the grass has a low innate ability, and the rhododendron has a high innate ability, and it comes down to their overall functional capacity. So this rhododendron soil community was able to decompose all litter types at almost twice the rate that the grass soil community was. So you can see how this can be applied to, our, to the decomposition experiment I'm about to show you. And so what did that look like? So we had various collection points for these litter bags over time. And the early collection points were driven by litter quality effects. So at our first two collections at four and seven months, variation in mass loss was driven by almost 70% attributable to litter chemical quality, which is what we would expect based on, again, broad scale litter decomposition experiments in the literature. And what did it look like? Well, good, our litter quality parameters matched with the highest litter quality matching um, the tulip poplar. So great, we get that effect pulled out. Well, what happens with ability, which is what we're really interested in? So at 23 months, this is when climate became significant in the model. and explained about 30% of the variation in decomposition. Well, the ability term was significant and showed a range in these different parameters, with the light bar representing the low elevation site and the dark bar representing the high elevation site. It really seems to reflect this range in climate moving up slope, right? So our low elevation is most ideal for decomposition. It has the highest ability, whereas the high elevation site is least ideal for decomp and has the lowest ability. It's like, oh, well, great, OK. So it's really supporting this idea of climate again. But remember, we replicated this in the lab. So what happens if we run this regression for the lab component, the microcosms that I just showed you? The ability terms match exactly, showing or suggesting that climate is matching perfectly with functional capacity when we're looking in the field. <clears throat> So what does this mean? Well, importantly, our decomposition experiment followed trajectories shown previously. So a big driver in thinking about decomposition across climatic gradients and large geographic scales has come from the long-term intersite decomposition experiment, or LIDET, across North America. It was this big 10-year um, litter decomposition experiment. And from this, they did find that initial dynamics were driven by litter quality, which we saw. And so it was great that that matched. But also, it's important that when these decomposition experiments show that climate come into play, it also matches ours. However, the ability differences align between the microcosm experiment where we take away the effect of climate and then also the field studies, showing that there's a masking of potential ability differences in the decomposer community. And then when we think about scaling up again, well, maybe this questions our validity of using these climate gradients for space, space for time substitutions. So if we think about decomposition processes, as litter progresses and becomes more decomposed within a biological pathway, it becomes more recalcitrant. And recalcitrant litter material is more affected or has a higher temperature response. Therefore, at a warm site, we may be seeing a heightened response to climate due to this interaction effect and a dampened response at a cool 
site, again due to an interaction effect, but it's showing an overall climate effect that's being shown in these models and these experiments, but hiding underlying mechanisms, which then questions whether we can actually project forward in time for a single location based on patterns generated across these climatic gradients. So again, we started the talk saying that at large spatial scales, climate's important, followed by litter quality, followed by this black box decomposer community. And I think my research demonstrates really that we don't know the relative importance of climate versus decomposers yet. It's an open question that we need to still consider and dig into more. <clears throat> and so finally, I want to end the talk today talking about a more recent work where we've narrowed in on a potential new abiotic decomposition pathway within temperate systems. So at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that photodegradation is a direct effect on litter decomposition in arid systems. So what is photodegradation? Well, lignin within litter and within woody material is photoreactive. So it can be directly volatilized into carbon monoxide or carbon dioxidized. Or it can be primed for biological degradation or broken apart into smaller compounds that are more easily processed by microbes. So in this figure here from 2010, on the x-axis you see your initial lignin percentage, and on the y-axis you see your final lignin percentage. And the one-to-one -one line is, um, is also shown. And so the pink diamonds represent photodegradation, and the green circles represent a biotic degradation of litter. And what you can note is that as decomposition proceeds using the photodegradation pathway, lignin actually decreases within concentration of that litter. But through a biotic pathway, it increases. And again, that's because lignin is really tough to decompose. It's a huge energy investment for the microbes with low energy return. And so they leave it be behind and that we often see that other compounds are taken up and decomposed in early decomposition dynamics and lignin increases in concentration and finally, when it's the final thing left, microbes are like, okay, we'll work on it now. But it's different with photodegradation. <clears throat> but importantly, these studies exploring this pathway have occurred in arid systems. And this researcher, Amy Austin, that's driven this work, has worked in South American grasslands to explore it. And another important part of a lot of this research is that they've elevated these decomposition chambers off the ground. So they've completely separated the potential for biotic interactions with photodegradation processes. And part of that is the assumption in these arid systems that the limitation of water in these high heat environments is really just not conducive for microbial degradation. But when you think about a temperate system, you have an entire winter and early spring time period where you have full sunlight hitting the forest floor. And there's a potential for photodegradation to occur that hasn't been explored. And so I collaborated with Robert Warren, Mark Bradford, and Tim Philly on this project down at the Coweta LTR again. So this is an, a picture of the full watershed. And within this, I worked on six sites, so three north-facing and three south-facing sites two high elevation and four mid elevation sites. With each site, we had three treatments. So there was a chamber with no plastic, so no filter. There was a chamber with an acetate plastic over the top, which blocked about 20% of UVB to act as, um, so our control was really to see if we had a plastic effect on that slight reduction acetate plastic. And then finally, we had this polyester treatment that reduced UVB by about 80 to 85%. And so within a site, we had these three treatments. And we also punctured the plastic to make sure that precipitation could still filter through. And at each site, there were three replicate blocks with the three treatments. And within a frame, there were two litter types. So we used oak and maple. And there were four <clears throat> or two of each species so that we could have two collections. <clears throat> and there were two litter collections one after the winter and early spring, so about this time of year where the trees are budding, we wanted to go out and get the litter after it had been exposed to full sunlight over the winter months, but before biological activity would start to ramp up and before the forest canopy closed. And then a second collection 
um, in the fall, right before the leaves dropped again, so that we could get an accounting of that biological pathway that we're expecting over the warm summer months. And so Tim Philly ran this TMAH analysis in order to analyze the different lignin compounds in the litter. And so our treatments were effective, which is great. So on the x-axis here are three treatments, the control, acetate, and polyester. And on the y-axis is our average UVB, with the color of the bar represent the north versus south facing sites. And what you can see is that there was no significant difference between control and acetate, fantastic in the amount of UVB hitting, but significantly reduced with the polyester, great. Um, and we also saw significantly greater light reaching the forest floor on our south facing slopes. Awesome, this is what we were hoping for. Also, um, soil moisture and soil temperature were not affected by treatment. So that was also another benefit. They were just, there was higher soil temperature and lower soil moisture on the south facing slopes regardless of treatment. Unfortunately, our mass loss was also not affected by treatment. Um, and so in the subsequent graphs that I will show you, I have averaged them by treatment because there was not a treatment effect with mass loss or lignin. But to show you that it did work, I had to at least show you that. Um, and so despite it not affecting mass loss, did we see a lignin response? And so this value here, this percentage SGC, so it's combining different um, lignin monomers into an estimated lignin yield, um, normalized by organic carbon content of the litter. And on the uh, x-axis here, we have the three different time periods. So we have the original litter, what was the content there, followed by collection one after the winter and collection two after a full, almost a full year. And on this graph in the next, it's set up the same way where oak is on the left side and maple is on the right. And what's cool is that despite not seeing differences in mass loss, we do see changes in lignin after collection one. So we see a drop in the total percentage lignin of all lignin compounds at collection one. So again, after the forest is open to full sunlight, and then it increases in proportion after biological activity takes over. And again, this designates that collection one is when we're thinking biological activity is suppressed, photodegradation is potentially active. Collection two is where biological degradation is expected. So you'd see higher lignin sitting around in the litter. Well, what's another way to look at this? So here, I'm not gonna get into the biochemistry of this, but I just wanna at least present to you more of a reference point of what I'm talking about. So this is just a visual example of a potential lignin molecule. And within this lignin, there are these different monomers of guaiacil and syringal units that can be cleaved off through decomposition or different processes. And there are specific monomers that get cleaved that are directly related to lignin. So there are many different methods of measuring lignin concentration, but this method actually shows you products that are directly coming from lignin and not things like tannin or other compounds in the leaf. So this here is an example of a G6 or S6 molecule, which I'll be showing you. So here, just looking at the syringal S6 monomer, again, this is the percentage of S6 on the y-axis in our original collection one and collection two on the x-axis. The proportion decreases after collection one and then increases for collection two, with more being lost on the south-facing slopes or the lighter green lines versus the north facing slopes or this darker green line. And the same happens for the G6 monomer. Now what's important here is that the guaiacil monomers are actually more resistant to biological degradation. And we see a larger change in collection one versus collection two. So we see a larger reduction in this monomer after collection one versus collection two, which is super exciting. Well, how else might we detect whether photodegradation is occurring versus just suppress biological activity over the winter months? Well, we can look at nitrogen dynamics. And so on the right here, I have a figure from a Parton paper from 2007 where he measures nitrogen dynamics. So for all of the figures on this slide, on the x-axis is mass remaining, moving from 100% down to zero, so a full original leaf down to completely gone. 
And on the y-axis, you have your fraction of initial N. So if it's greater than one, you have nitrogen immobilization, and their microbes are taking in nitrogen. And if it's less than one, then it's my nitrogen mineralization, and nitrogen is being lost from the system. So what Parton was able to show is that in arid systems, so this darker purple line, you always see a loss of nitrogen during photodegradation. But with a biological pathway in a humid grassland, we see nitrogen being immobilized to different degrees depending on your starting nitrogen content and how much the microbes working to decompose that litter need more nitrogen to produce enzymes and, and other um, activities. So how does that relate to our two litter types? And so on the top, we have the oak litter with a starting nitrogen value of about 1.2%. And on the bottom, we have our maple litter with a starting value of about 0.64% nitrogen. So the oak relates most clo closely to Parton's figure F. Now the darker green represents collection one litter bags, and the lighter green represents collection two. It's important to note here that starting with our oak litter here, we see a decrease or mineralization occurring across collection one dynamics, and an increase or immobilization occurring and later dynamics, even for the same mass loss value. So there's definitely distinct nitrogen dynamics during the time period where we think there might be a signal of photodegradation occurring or lignin losses early on. Maple less so, but it's important to see that the darker green signals are doing something different than collection two for the same mass loss values. So whether or not there's fungal decomposition occurring during the winter months or not, with these nitrogen values, we would expect to see nitrogen being immobilized, and it's not. So overall, I think our data does show a potential signal of photodegradation in temperate forest litter. And while our experimental design only blocked UVB, there's actually been new evidence coming in the, out in the past year showing that potentially visible light is now a larger driver of photo degradation effects. So unfortunately, we missed that in our experimental design, so we can't necessarily deduce photo degradation. Um, but at least we're not completely surprised that we didn't see a treatment effect coming to light with our lignin or mass loss data. But whether or not this is photo degradation occurring, it's important to know that we have potentially alternative lignin, lignin dynamics occurring within the system. So in traditional decomposition experiments, we see time and time again lignin accumulating and decomposing litter over time until, the, again, the microbes are forced to decompose it because it's the last carbon substrate left. And if we're losing lignin during initial dynamics where we're expecting labile compounds to be going, that may affect how we're, again, cycling carbon within the system and just thinking generally about decomposition dynamics. So overall, what do I want you guys to walk away with today? Well, microbes matter, and they matter no matter what system you're working in. Um, this idea of functional breadth has now been reinforced through my use of empirical data, but I think it's important when thinking and scaling up and thinking again about forest dynamics and the cycling of carbon at larger spatial scales. But importantly, we yet do not know the relative importance of climate versus decomposer community function. So my research brings out the role of the decomposer function, how it can vary over space and may add, interact with climate, but we know, don't know yet how to parse them apart to quantify their relative importance. And that's something that still needs to get explored. And then finally, I'm really excited that there's potential for photo degradation in temperate systems. And again, if not, this alternative loss of lignin during early decomposition dynamics that hasn't yet been demonstrated. So I just want to quickly acknowledge my collaborators, others that have helped along the way, my funding agencies, and with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you.